So it's my great pleasure now to introduce uh, Rihanna Patrick as our keynote speaker. And I'm really thrilled um, to have Rihanna here to do this uh, keynote presentation. Um, so Rihanna is a, a Torres Strait Islander journalist, broadcaster and content creator. She's currently co-host of The Briefing, which is Australia's fastest growing daily news podcast. And uh, prior to that, she was head of audio and podcast development at Indigenous X. And this followed almost 19 years working for the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, including for Triple J, Message Stick, uh, Speaking Out and for ABC Radio National. Rihanna um, has also co-curated uh, exhibitions for the Queensland Museum um, and she was the co-producer and co-writer of Hi, I'm Eddie, a six-part series about Eddie Marbo commissioned by the State Library of Queensland. Um, and in her spare time, uh, because she has so much of it, uh, Rihanna is also collaborating on a research project um, about Indigenous knowledges and journalism education here at QUT. And um, I'm lucky enough to be uh, collaborating with her and a number of researchers on that project. So uh, we're thrilled to have Rihanna with us here today and uh, to speak about Indigenous journalists' experiences with news media and um, how we might encourage young people to um, consume news more critically. So thanks, Rihanna. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, just as a Torres Strait Islander, I spend every waking hour of my day walking on other people's country, land which is not my own and to which I have no bloodline connections to. So I just want to pay my respects to the Agor and Turrbal peoples, traditional custodians of this land, um, and thank them for their custodianship of lands, waterways and skyways as well, and that I am lucky enough to do my living and creation on lands here. Um, my high school and university, I'm probably going to really date myself right now too, Gavin, as well. Um, my high school and university years were the whole of the 1990s, best decade ever. And while it was a time of Britpop, the re-emergence of corduroy CDs and cast singles, it was also a time of great change in the Indigenous affairs space, which I remember quite well. It was a time when ATSIC, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, was formed, the legal disproving of the myth of terra nullius, the creation of this new concept concept known as Native Title, uh, the UN Year of Indigenous Peoples, the WIC People's Successful Native Title Win, then the Howard Government's Native Title Bill, which holds the record in this country as the longest Senate debate on a single bill, which was 56 hours and eight minutes. But there was also an amendment to that bill, which was debated for 49 hours and 48 minutes. So in total, there was 100 hours spent on this one bill and its amendment. And that that record still holds today. But it was also a time when these brightly coloured plastic hands on wooden sticks were stuck into the ground outside of Parliament House in Canberra and King George Square here in Brisbane when it had grass um, as an outpouring of support from non-Indigenous Australians towards reconciliation and what that future might look like in the new millennium which was fast approaching along with Y2K. Um, and a little bit of that history if you weren't in Brisbane at the time or remember the installation, the Sea of Hands, but you too were actually on tour at the time that it was in front of King George Square and they went down, signed a bunch of hands, planted them and I've always wanted to know where they ended up and if ANTAR, the Australians of Native Title and Reconciliation, still have them. Um, but it was a time of much history being created and history which I knew was being created as I found myself on the sidelines in those late later years of the 90s reporting it. The deficit narrative in the reporting was also extraordinarily strong and at times incredibly racist. It was also a time when Indigenous media exist, didn't exist as much as it does today to take on the giants of the media landscape in offering an alternative perspective. And after looking back and thinking about what was once the norm, in 2023, I wonder where we are now. Has the landscape changed? Has the language used in reporting us changed? Or is the harm the media inflicts on our communities still the same? While well, some reporting has shifted and you're more likely to see positive stories from our communities, in the 1990s that sort of reporting was only really found in the fortnightly pages of Lismore-based Indigenous newspaper, The Koori Mail. Despite all these decades later, the reporting of Indigenous affairs and the Indigenous community still remains problematic, to say the least. 
if anything, the story has now shifted to being, I guess, more personal with the focus in more recent months, particularly on Indigenous journalists who can now find themselves making the news rather than reporting it. Even those with lower profiles are finding themselves in the crosshairs of various mainstream media outlets as the central figure to stories. It's something I've never seen in my 25 or so years doing this job, that my often overworked, often lowly paid Indigenous colleagues working in mainstream media organisations can become central to a story for something they wrote or said publicly. While small inroads are being made not only in what is being reported but indeed who is doing the reporting, the Australian media still hasn't grasped how to treat our communities with humanity. Only last week the Australian Financial Review chose to run an ad for the No Vote campaign to the Indigenous Voice to Parliament. The cartoon featured an ad that was incredibly a racist depiction of Yes Vote advocate and fellow Torres Strait Islander Thomas Mayo. It showed the caricature of Mayo appearing to dance for money, which was in the hand of West Farmer Chairman Michael Cheney. His daughter, Federal MP and member for Curtin, Kate Cheney, is depicted as a little girl in this cartoon, sitting on her father's lap in a teal dress as he holds his cash out of reach of Mayo. The Australian Financial Review ended up apologising for the ad, but not before both sides of politics, both current and former politicians, voiced their dis disapproval. Although this was an ad and not a story, it's still an example of how media continues to pe perpetuate outdated stereotypes and negative connotations about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. So why does this keep happening? Well, in order to really understand that relationship that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders have with the media in this country, you have to go right back, back to when colonial newspapers were getting their start in the colony. While these newspapers started as a way of keeping the colony up to date with what was happening back in England at the time, they also covered life on the frontier, which included what the natives were up to. When you scroll through Trove and read some of the earliest examples of journalism in this country, you quickly realise how this us and them mentality begins to form the foundation of how Aboriginal communities and issues are written about. From attacks by blacks to stories about how blacks were killed as the Sydney colony grew, for instance, as interactions with local natives became more frequent, so too does the reporting on these interactions in colonial newspapers of the time. As the frontier wars and massacres of Aboriginal people ramp up, so does the reporting, which starts to strip away Aboriginal people's humanity in the process. This sets Aboriginal people up as the villains, a threat, a problem to be dealt with and as non-humans. And that lack of humanity in the way that we're seeing is most prevalent in stories around policing, crime and court stories, and even the reporting of the deaths of our young people. In March last year, coverage of the Zachary Rolfe verdict by The Australian was called a national disgrace by Gumaroy journalist Madeleine Heyman reba Judge Awarang Yorta Yorta journalist Bridget Brennan and Wajak Nunga journalist Narelda Jacobs also publicly condemned the coverage. If you're not familiar with the case, Northern Territory Police Officer Zachary Rolfe was acquitted of murder and other related charges for the 2019 shooting of 19-year-old Kumanjai Walker in Uendamu. As part of its coverage, The Weekend Australia published on-camera interview with Rolfe, which was conducted in late 2019, which was interspersed with graphic scenes of the body camera footage showing Mr Walker on the floor of the police station as police gave first aid. Footage the family had never seen and the publishing of which went against cultural protocols, among other things. The newspaper also published several negative stories about Walker, including a depiction of him as a very scary man and an unwanted baby, and a headline which implied that his family had told police where to find him. In condemning the reporting, Ms Jacobs told Guardian Australia they portrayed him as an unwanted baby, as a criminal in every single thing that he did. They painted a picture of someone who deserved to be killed to justify the police actions on that day, whereas the thing that was on trial was the second and third shots that were fired. Christopher Dorr, the then editor-in-chief of The Australian, wrote an editorial justifying that the reporting was an unvarnished truth. He wrote, romanticising life on remote communities does not make it less bad for those who are experiencing neglect or terror. He went on to write, the unvarnished truth is what is needed to protect the innocent and bring about change. The problem with this last sentence is that from my own lived experience and experience in journalism, even when Indigenous people are the innocent, we are never protected in how the media portrays us. 
The unvarnished truth didn't help normal man Terence Flowers when he was wrongfully identified by Channel 7 as the alleged kidnapper of four-year-old Cleo Smith. Indigenous media, however, was there to help. Mr Flowers was visiting his child in Caratha Hospital when his sister told him of the initial Channel 7 Facebook post, naming him as the suspect. That post was taken down after Mr Flowers complained to the Caratha police, but seven years later shared the misinformation to social media. His photo, which was taken from Facebook, was used in Seven's broadcasts, an online article, a tweet and a Facebook post about the arrest of a different man, but with Mr Flowers' photo, which was attached to all the coverage. The man who was arrested for kidnapping um, Cleo Smith had a similar name to Mr Flowers, who used his mother's maiden name, Kelly, on the Facebook profile. Mr Flowers went back to Caratha Police, but had a panic attack when at the station. He became so distressed that he needed medical attention. Mr Flowers ended up speaking to Pilbara Indigenous media organisation, Garda Media, which broke the exclusive that he had been misidentified. His interview with Garda Media was quoted and played across Australia and internationally. It was during this interview that he signalled his intention to sue Channel 7 for defamation. It was also that interview that got him legal representation to do so. Last year, Mr Flowers successfully sued Seven for an apology and compensation for his ordeal. This doesn't, of course, change the that fact that his photo is now everywhere when you Google his name, or that the wind takes away the harassment, and both physically and also the harassment he faced online um, when he was incorrectly identified. But it's just one example of why Indigenous media continues to matter in this country. I started my career in Indigenous radio and knew this sector incredibly well at the time um, as I worked across many different areas of it while it was still in formation. And since the establishment of the Central Australian Aboriginal Media Association or CARMA at Alice Springs in 1982, the sector has only continued to grow. What many in this room might not realise is that Australia is unique in that it has an extensive Indigenous radio network, which no other country in the world has. There is an Indigenous radio station in every capital city in Australia, Bar Canberra, Adelaide and Hobart. I was working in an Indigenous radio policy organisation, NEMA, the National Indigenous Media Association of Australia, when Indigenous radio stations in various parts of the country were applying for radio licences. I'm currently working part-time for NERS, the National Indigenous Radio Service, which was the sister organisation to NEMA. It provided radio programming via satellite to aspirant Indigenous radio stations to meet their licensing requirements in showing that they could broadcast for 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it still does that, even now and has added in the last decade or so a national news service with stations, both Indigenous and community radio stations, can take free of charge. While Indigenous radio stations were busy being set up by local communities across the country, and there are about a hundred of them, the newspaper Koori Mail was also starting its fortnightly national rollout in 1991. The newspaper is owned by five Bundjalung Aboriginal community organisations. Making it into the pages of the Koori Mail has definitely become a bucket list item for many members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community. I have a great love of this paper because it really was a beacon of positivity in seeing my community in a way that I didn't see too often in mainstream media in the 1990s. And if you're not a Koori Mail subscriber, then I highly recommend you become one. The Courier Mail doesn't just put money back into its community of origin, but it also provides help where it can to other media, Indigenous media organisations, one of which is Torres News. And I wanted to mention Torres News because for the first time in 66 years since the paper was established on Thursday Island, it's finally been handed over to Torres Strait Islanders. Torres Strait Radio for Meribah Wakai now runs the weekly paper as well as the radio station and it's largely due to the help of the Koori Mail and what they've given them. The Torres News is very much by community, for community in terms of the newspaper and the, the stories that it reports, but it also keeps mainland islander communities like myself connected with all the news back home. And it's not just connecting people that Indigenous people, do, um, that Indigenous media I should say does well. Indigenous media and particularly Indigenous radio was instrumental in keeping Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders safe during the height of the pandemic. 
Will Kenya Radio in northwestern New South Wales use their station to keep students connected by broadcasting lessons during lockdown? Each day, teachers took to the airwaves to teach so that students could continue learning. The station also dropped off activity packs and other school supplies, so students had some kind of schedule to keep. And it wasn't just students who were looked after either by the radio station. Many Indigenous radio stations, including Wilcannia, organised supply drops for elders, making sure that masks, sanitizer, food and water were in good supply for our old people. This is the power of Indigenous media in this country, that it not only allows the voice of Indigenous people to be heard, but it also provides the support on the ground when it's most needed. I've been away from the Indigenous media sector for about 23 years, and coming back to me, it's clear that the sector is still struggling to survive like it was when I first started. Many Indigenous radio stations are still heavily reliant on volunteers and government funding to keep going. Those with paid staff fluctuate with the ending of each financial year. The question of how to create a self-sustainable Indigenous radio sector is yet to be answered and might not be for some time. Without proper resourcing, diverse income streams, skilled staff, the ability to bring Indigenous practitioners back from mainstream media organisation and be able to pay them well, I'm really unsure what the future will look like for the next two decades to come. While I'm talking about where, the, where Indigenous media has come from and where it's going, I need to acknowledge, acknowledge the history of mainstream Indigenous programming as well, like Message Stick on ABC TV, um, which now no longer exists, Living Black on SBS TV, the establishment of NITV, the National Indigenous Television, um, or channel as it is now, um, and Indigenous-led radio programs like Away, and speaking out on Radio National or NITV Radio on SBS, which was originally known as the Aboriginal program for more than two decades. The importance of legacy Indigenous programming at the national broadcasters can't be forgotten. The Aboriginal program on SBS was the first radio program uh, to be fronted by an Indigenous presenter, while Speaking Out, um, which originally started on ABC Local Radio and now goes to ABC Local Radio and Radio National, went a step further by being the first mainstream Indigenous radio program to be presented and produced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, both on air and behind the scenes. And Speaking Out's Little Sister Away was started three years later on Radio National, which is how we refer to these programs, by the way, when you work on them, Away is the Little Sister, um, you know, um, is still the only national Indigenous arts and culture radio program in Australia. And for more than three decades, both these Indigenous radio programs at the ABC have been instrumental in presenting Indigenous perspectives through Indigenous voices on air, driven by Indigenous producers behind the scenes. The legacy of these programs can't be underestimated in their work in educating the wider population of listeners and viewers who might not otherwise access Indigenous media. I was well aware when I was presenting and producing Speaking Out that my main audience was white men aged 45 and over. Oddly specific, I know, but finding the right balance for the majority of a non for a majority non-indigenous audience, while also giving something to an indigenous audience who might already um, know the guest well, was a skill in itself. But the work these programs have done on radio and TV have broken down the doors for a lot of what we have today. And these days, it's not unusual to hear Daniel Browning presenting the art show on Radio National, to see Miriam Korowa reading the news, or know that there is now an Indigenous news executive um, in Walkley Award winner Susan Dredge, who is leading a national Indigenous reporting unit. University trained journalists are common, and I've got to be honest, Triple J is probably the blackest it's been in nearly its 50 year history at the moment. But this hasn't happened in isolation. It's happened because of programs like Away Speaking Out or even further back to Blackout, the predecessor to Message Stick on the ABC, which was the first primetime Indigenous program hosted by Indigenous people, featuring Indigenous people who were also interviewed by Indigenous people. But it is, however, disappointing that despite the history and legacy of programs like Speaking Out and Away, more promotion isn't given to these programs or the Indigenous content they produce, which balances out the offering on whatever network they find themselves on. The legacy of these mainstream Indigenous programs and Indigenous media more broadly is that despite a severe lack of resources, the wider Indigenous media landscape continues to expand. The advent of new technologies and social media platforms means there's a growing number of online Indigenous publishers. Indigenous X, Common Ground and the National Indigenous Times continue to give our perspectives in new online spaces. 
Indigenous X, if you've never heard of it, started its life as a hashtag on Twitter and then became one of the first rotational accounts on Twitter where a different Indigenous person took over the Indigenous X account each week sharing their perspectives, views, histories, and anything else they wanted to tweet about. I tweeted about Doctor Who. It was about showing the diversity of Indigenous people while dispelling the generic homogenous view of our community that we all think and act the same. It was about showing our humanity and getting our experience to the non-Indigenous audience in the first person. Indigenous X is also the reason commentary or opinion journalism from an Indigenous perspective in this country exists. Indigenous X was the first to provide opinion articles written by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. It found audience traction quickly in the opinions it provided on a number of topics playing out in the news at various times that there are too many to mention. But when The Guardian entered the Australian media landscape with Guardian Australia, Indigenous X was one of the first partnerships it secured so that each weekly host would not only have their article published on the Indigenous X website and on the Twitter channel, but it would also be published in The Guardian Australia's opinion section. That development of opinion writing Indigenous talent has gone on um, to see that talent also write more generally for the opinion section of Guardian Australia and not just when hosting the Indigenous X Twitter account. And that work has also led to many of those original contributors now writing for other online publications. Twitter also saw in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders regularly creating trending hashtags with their commentary on Indigenous affairs or when the mainstream media again attacked our communities. Again, there were many instances where Indigenous X and the Indigenous Twitter community created viral moments, but one which comes to mind is hashtag Indigenous Dads, which has been written about in an academic paper co-authored by one of my favourite Aboriginal academics, and yes, I have many. Bronwyn Coulson, who is pretty much the preeminent Indigenous academic on all things Indigenous social media. Trauma, shared recognition and Indigenous resistance on social media in the Australasian Journal of Information Systems 2017, um, which she was one of the co-authors of, investigated ways in which Indigenous Australians respond individually or collectively to racial vilification by means of social media sites. In 2016, the Australian published a cartoon by Bill Leake, which depicted an Aboriginal boy being held by the collar of his shirt by a police officer who is returning him to his father who is holding a beer can. The officer says, you'll have to sit down and talk to your son about personal responsibility. The father replies, yeah, righto. What's his name then? Too drunk apparently to remember. The cartoon was widely shared on social media, often accompanied with comments that were largely racist and derogatory about Indigenous parents and Indigenous fathers in particular. The cartoon was defended by then Prime Minister Ma Malcolm Turnbull and former Prime Minister John Howard for not being racist. In response, Aboriginal father and tweeter Joe Bayliss um, tweeted an image of himself and his children with the comment, to counter the Bill Leake cartoon, here's a pic of me and my kids. I'm a proud Aboriginal father. Joel tagged Indigenous X in his tweet, which led to other Indigenous people taking to Twitter to express their outrage at the cartoon and the way Indigenous men and their families had been portrayed. From there, the Indigenous Dads hashtag campaign was born, with others posting celebrations of their relationships with their fathers and other significant role models in their families. In Coulson's paper, Indigenous X founder Luke Pearson said Indigenous Dads campaign was an important demonstration aimed at countering racist depictions and stereotypes, an essential reminder in any national conversation that is going to take place. It sets the conversation tone and reminds us and reinforces the importance of our collective strength and our humanity. This again highlights the power and visibility that social media has given Indigenous voices. But Twitter isn't the only place that Indigenous people have harnessed the power of, with younger Indigenous people showing how you can break down stereotypes in Instagram and TikTok. Before her research into Indigenous resistance on social media, Carlson spent three years researching the social media habits of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders. And what she found was that our community is quite unique in how it uses social media platforms. At a time when many non-Indigenous young people were dropping social media platforms like Facebook because their parents were online, or maybe even their mother or father-in-laws, um, Indigenous young people were actively engaging with older generations and maintaining intergenerational connections. This same study found that older Indigenous people used social media as a way to stay connected with culture and family that was important to them. Social media was also being used in language revitalisation and maintenance, particularly in private groups on Facebook. This is something I can definitely vouch for as a member of the Miriam Mir language Facebook group. 
um, and seeing all of those conversations happen where we're tested each day on what a particular sentence is, I'm nowhere close to even deciphering that, I might add as I am not a native language speaker of Eastern Island language. But Carlson's research also found at the time that 20% more Indigenous people used social media than non-Indigenous people. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander young people are very much driving social media at the moment, particularly in the spaces on Instagram and TikTok. They're using it as a way to educate the wider community on what it means to be an Indigenous person in this country, sharing their experiences and history. Young people in general are very good, I find, at breaking down complex ideas or issues into short videos for either TikTok or Instagram. I once watched a 20-something year old Indigenous Hawaiian explain uh, in a TikTok video how Indigenous Hawaiians were being priced out of Hawaii after Meta founder Mark Zuckerberg bought 1,500 acres on Kauai. Young people are very deft at explainer videos and have a natural ability, I find, in creating them. And Indigenous people also have this skill, particularly young ones from what I've seen. At the height of the pandemic, probably like you, I spent a lot of time on Instagram. But what I started to notice with this, was that there was this trend from our relatives over the seas. Many Indigenous young people in so-called Canada were using Instagram reels and TikTok to dispel myths about their own communities, educating, educating the masses in innovative and often hilarious ways. And one of my favourites, which I definitely think you should look up, is Notorious Cree. Uh, his stuff is great. Um, but this trend of combating negative perceptions culminated with the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement as well. And with the pandemic and this worldwide movement against police brutality, it supercharged the perspectives of Indigenous peoples across the world. Tens of thousands of people on Instagram and TikTok were now actively looking for non-white perspectives. Indigenous people in Australia gained so many followers that some became major social media influencers overnight. Non-Indigenous followers wanted to hear about their lived experiences and short video was what they were gravitating towards. These Indigenous influencers were sometimes creating the news, reporting on it and providing audiences, whether they were young or not, with their perspectives ahead of major media organisations. And it's probably no surprise that news consumption was up during the pandemic. The Reuters Institute Oxford University study navigating infodemic, how people in six countries access and rate news and information about coronavirus 2020, found millennials and Generation Z were turning to Instagram as a news source. In the six countries it looked at, Argentina, Germany, South Korea, Spain, the UK and the US, it found that young people in Argentina, South Korea, Spain and the US were much more likely to rely on social media, while in Germany, the UK, and again, the US, to rely also on messaging application groups. Of those surveyed, over a quarter of respondents aged 18 to 24 used Instagram to access news content within the last week, while 19% used Snapchat and 6% turned to TikTok. In comparison, only 17% used newspapers to access information. Globally, figures reached even higher levels. In Germany, 38% of 18 to 24 year olds used Instagram alone to access the news. And in Argentina, it was a lot higher from the respondents, 49%. A majority of respondents in every country said that the news media helped them to understand the crisis and explained what they could do. However, one in three also said they felt the news media had exaggerated the pandemic. Turning to Australia and as I am at QUT, QUT's Digital Media Research Centre and the Western Sydney study, News and Young Australians 2020, how young people access, perceive and are affected by news media, surveyed just over a thousand young Australians nationally aged eight, eight to 16 years. It aimed to understand news engagement and experiences. It found that news consumption by young Australians had become more frequent and more social. For instance, the study asked young Australians where they go for their news from the previous day. 88% said that they had used news from at least one source and 54% had got news from their family. This was followed by television at 36%, school teachers at 33% and social media networks taking up 29%. Few said they read the, newspa the newspaper, only 4%. For Australian young people, Instagram was the most common way to get news, followed by Facebook and YouTube. Close to half paid little attention to the source of news stories online. They trusted their families more than news organisations. Many said the news made them afraid and only 20% said they got lessons in developing news media literacy. A large proportion believed the news media failed to serve them well, but they had ideas of how organisations could do better at it. 
And when it comes to how young Indigenous people are consuming news, well, I haven't yet seen, and again, it might not be in the circles that I travel in, um, research which tells me, um, and if there is research out there, I'd love to know, particularly from Indigenous academics. But, you know, I'm always interested in wanting to know more about how young people and young Indigenous people, what their habits are with news consumption, how they understand news and what their level of trust is, I guess, with news organisations. You know, our population is young and the median age as of the last census was 24. And most of us live either in New South Wales, Western Sydney or in Queensland. But when I look around at what is on offer for our young people, there is little media which is aimed at them, Indigenous or otherwise. And it makes me think of my news consumption when I was younger. I was, I think, a strange kid. I really enjoyed the news. I do think some of this came down to the fact I grew up in a very remote mining community on the western side of Cape York, um, on Cape York Peninsula, um, where my job uh, most weeks was to go down to the town authority office and pick up the then book site uh, mail. Um, it was called, um, the, yeah, um, the book site um, newspaper which was 10 cents at the time. And it was, I'm pretty sure photocopied and then folded together and then stapled. And the photos were so pixelated, but you could still, still kind of see yourself if you'd made it in. Um, but it used to be the only way you could tell what was on the television, which at that stage was one channel, which was the ABC. There was no radio, there was just the ABC. And so I grew up with news, I grew up watching the seven o'clock news was an event in my household. I grew up with all of that um, news at the time in the 80s, which was a lot of conflict. Um, I don't get nervous by seeing news, but I understand how young people might if it's something they haven't grown up with. And so I understand this, but I've also watched how my own consumption has changed. I mean, I grew up with my non-Indigenous grandparents whose first thing in the morning was to turn on um, ABC radio and it would be on for most of the day until maybe Wheel of Fortune in the afternoon, which my grandmother absolutely loved. Um, but, you know, they, it was a household where the paper got bought every day. It was a household where you would pour over the weekend newspapers through every section and their sections would be rotating around whoever was at the breakfast table at that time. Um, I used to buy the newspaper as a high schooler, which I think was very uncommon probably a little bit nerdy as well. Um, but it was this access to information that I never had while growing up in the 1980s and living in such a remote area. And so I just consumed everything that I could. But even now I find, I mean, Twitter is a bin fire, let's be honest, um, but it is still the place that I go to to find news. But as an Indigenous journalist, it's also, inc it's an incredibly unsafe space for me at the moment, which is why my account is set to private, um, particularly after all of the Stan Grant um, news came out um, but it you know I look at how I consume news now and I am definitely that person on Instagram finding the news whether that's Indigenous news from overseas or whether that's Indigenous news happening here or other news that may be of interest so I wonder how our young people are consuming that, how our young people are coming to that, but also what it is like to be a young Indigenous person right now, where you have access to so much Indigenous media that never existed in my early life. Um, but you're probably wondering why I've taken you on this journey of those early beginnings of journalism in the colony and why Indigenous media matters. And I hope that um, you come to realise that the language you use when you analyse or dissect the media with young people really does matter and it is vitally important. And if I return to how frontier massacres were reported, I mean, the University of Newcastle has been doing a lot of work, um, particularly around the mapping of massacres. And they found that the reporting of them was also often indirect. It was a type of code that was used in the reporting. Um, euphemisms like clear the area, pacify, teach them a lesson, affray, collision or fell upon were used. Um, there were other massacre sites which were alluded to by place names like Skull Creek or Blackfellow's Bones Boar. Um, other locations which were named after colonists who had committed the atrocities like Bunbury um, in Western Australia named after um, Lieutenant William Bunbury, a key perpetrator in several frontier massacres in 1836 and 1837. Uh, Coots Crossing uh, in New South Wales named after settler Thomas Coots who poisoned 14 Aboriginal people in the 1940s. So I guess knowing how the colonial media operated, its close relationship also to policing at the time and how that colonial narrative and relationship has carried through to now is why language used when you're having those important conversations and dissecting mainstream media 
dissecting what is being reported on in Aboriginal affairs, but also how communities um, are being reported is, um, is vital that the language and the terminology used fits what is happening while understanding where that colonial narrative is coming from in most of these sources. Um, and I think, you know, that's why I've spent so much time on Indigenous media sources, because Indigenous journalists' perspectives, I think, can help in uncovering, if I use, Dawes unvarnished truth. You know, that unvarnished truth will be vital to truth telling in this state as we continue on a path to treaty. And once you know the history of what is embedded in our news media and how that harks back to the early colony and how that still harks back, you begin to see those patterns in the reporting of Indigenous affairs and our communities that we've seen and known for all too long. And the pandemic, along with Black Lives Matter, um, you know, it disrupted and challenged the norm across many sectors. And some of that fallout, if you like, has seen major newspapers and media organisations apologising for the coverage of Indigenous people in various countries. Um, the most recently was last month when the Sydney Morning Herald um, apologised for their coverage of the Mile Creek Massacre in 1838 and the subsequent trial of those who committed the murders. And it's the only time in Australian history that those responsible for a massacre of Aboriginal people were ever put on trial. Um, Stuff.co.nz apologised to the Maori community for its portrayal over a 160 year period and acknowledged how this reporting had directly affected policies which caused irreparable damage um, to the Maori community, um, which still continues today. And while apologies are a good start, um, you know, acknowledging how the colonial narrative has been upheld while committing to break that dominance is the only way real change is going to happen in the sector that I work in. So the next time you click on a news story about the Indigenous community, I hope you think deeply about what I've spoken about today, because once the blinkers come off, I doubt you'll ever be able to interact with the Australian media in the same way that you used to. You know, think about your own bias that you bring and how you discuss the news, what you believe, what your source is and whether you interact with our points of view from the community, you know, and whether there are other points of view from the community that's being reported on. You know, seek out alternative but factual and well-researched alternatives. Um, and there are a bunch of social media influencers on both Instagram and TikTok that are doing this work incredibly well, um, who are not journalists, but I guess I see that as the next phase in, I guess, what we termed a long time ago, citizen journalism. You know, think about how you can bring this into a classroom or how yourself can encourage young people to give a short video explainer a go, for instance. Um, because I think what you're likely to find is that the way that young people interact and create and do these explainer videos, they know those issues really well. They just never get a chance to be able to do it in a way that speaks uh, to the way that they would like to tell that story. Um, and while I think, um, you know, I'd like to think that change is possible, I have to admit that I'm a firm believer now that change can only come through a strong, robust and well-resourced Indigenous media sector that can reclaim skilled germ Indigenous journalists and media practitioners. And so think about what you click on, how the colonial narrative is at play in that story that you're reading or listening to, and definitely support Indigenous media in this country. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Ree, uh, for that really um, amazing keynote presentation and for taking us on that journey, which is, um, which is incredibly revealing and reminds us of um, just how much we do need to take the blinkers off. It's very easy for us to continually um, turn away from what is an ongoing problem in this country in relation to how mainstream media is um, is treating Indigenous people. So thank you so much for that. Um, so we now have um, an opportunity for people to ask questions. And I think we have, uh, we will have a roving microphone coming around um, for anyone who would like to ask a question. Um, so please raise your hand if you would like to ask uh, Rihanna a question. Um, but if, uh, while you're perhaps gathering your thoughts, I, I'm happy to start with a question or two, um, but yeah, um, please don't be shy. Put your hand up. Um, the the first question I've got I've got a number right, but the first question um, that I would like to start with is um, about what you were saying about the Indigenous radio network in Australia, um, and um, it, it occurs to me I think it was really um, interesting what you were saying about how the, the community role 
that Indigenous radio plays. And you, you mentioned the pandemic, for instance, and the important role that um, Indigenous radio stations played, not just in terms of getting information out, but actually doing things on the ground and you know responding at that community level. And I think that's such a powerful reminder that media plays um, this, it plays a, an informational role, it plays an educational role, um, and it also plays a community building role, and, and media does that for all of us. Um, but I wanted, wondered if you could say just a bit more about perhaps even some other examples of where Indigenous radio as a network is a kind of vital piece of infrastructure in Australia. Just making sure I'm not um, in front of the yeah. speaker as well, you know, feedback radio. Um, yeah, look, I guess, um, you know, Indigenous media um, actually sits in a really weird space sometimes because um, predominantly its funding doesn't come from the communications part of policy. It actually comes from health. Um, and back in the day, it was because a lot of health messaging was put out through Indigenous radio, and it still is. The problem is, is that I guess the responsibilities that we have have changed as well, that it's not just health anymore, that there are these other things that communities find themselves doing. I think, you know, one of the most interesting examples that I can think of, because um, when I was at NEMA, the National Indigenous Media Association of Australia, the reason why we don't have an Indigenous radio station in Canberra was because Spectrum had run out. And so there are um, a couple of places, um, Canberra and Adelaide are one of them, where the licence was given to a non-Indigenous organisation, but with the proviso that they would have Indigenous programming as part of their schedule. Um, so there is Indigenous programming in both Adelaide and Canberra. I'm not sure about Hobart, but one of the most interesting things I've seen, and it was a young person that started this, um, is One Mob Radio, which um, is in Gumbangi country uh, in Coffs Harbour. It's an internet radio station, which I think is absolutely genius when you have one, no money, two, can't afford, there is no spectrum, and three, you probably can't afford that licence if it ever came up anyway. Um, and he decided, Lachlan um, Skinner decided he wanted to start this radio station to keep his community informed, realised he didn't have a lot of money, so went, mm, internet's where I need to be. Set it up on pretty much, I think, a couple of thousand dollars. Um, they now have an app. And one of the things that they kept getting asked by particularly old people was um, a lot of our old people couldn't understand how they could listen to it because they're AM, FM, they get that, they don't get this internet stuff or this mobile phone stuff, right? And so they've got this app and they basically got young people from the station and in the community to go to old people, to their homes and show them how to use the app. So there's one button that they press and they can listen to one mob for as long as they want, but it's easy. And what they've found more recently is that the take up of that app by other old people in the community, because the old people that have been trained are trained in the other old people and it's spreading like wildfire, is they all know how to use this app. And so accessibility um, hasn't been, a, you know, the lack of it hasn't been a factor for them. And I think that's, a, you know, really interesting of a young person working out a way that fit with his budget. It's so black, I love it. Um, a bit of getting news out and it makes me think now, like if that's the future and that's what other communities could learn from if they had good access to, I guess, the internet and um, the ability to stream, that we could one day, for example, and Stephanie, I don't want to scare you or anything, but you could have 10 Embassy Radio on the steps of Old Parliament House out the front, broadcasting from Canberra and filling the gap that we've had in this country for about 20 or so years, where we haven't had an Indigenous radio station in our nation's capital. So I think, you know, just seeing the way that Indigenous radio has also been able to adapt um, to budget, to resourcing restrictions, um, to what has come in that digital um, evolution. Um, I find that incredibly exciting and I, I wish that more people would talk to Lachlan from other communities who do have good internet to say, how can we do this? How can we set up our own little thing here that means we can directly speak to our community? I'm looking for hands um, going up in the audience to ask Regana a question because I'll just keep up. Oh, yeah, well, uh, Tama has one, so we might go to Tama. The microphone's closer to Tama. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask specifically a little bit about Twitter and the fact that it, you know, it Indigenous X and, and various ways of using social media 
not necessarily for community building, but for community um, presence in a wider sense. And I guess I'm curious about the, you know, the current, as you say, the current state of Twitter is, is so toxic that many communities are just backing out altogether. And initially I was going to ask about the impact of that, but now I'm curious if you think there are lessons already to learn in the way that communities almost um, established other presences that can replace that already. It feels like the infrastructure for Indigenous Australians is already better thought out to how to lo lose Twitter and it not be that hugely impactful. So could you comment on that a little? Yeah, black follow Twitter is a thing. It's actually a hashtag. Yep. Um, where the community talks about a, like whatever, a lot of different things. They actually did um, Blackfella karaoke or karaoke or murioke as we call it from up here, which kept us all thoroughly entertained during the pandemic as well. But um, I guess that's a really interesting because I'm noticing a lot of Indigenous people, particularly um, now that Twitter is going the way that it is, who aren't necessarily on Instagram, but who are now gravitating towards threads. And a lot, like that's all I've seen in the last week. Uh, a lot of the people that I follow gravitating to threads. I haven't yet. And part of that is because I don't know, like I like to give my Indigenous data sovereignty a bit of thought before diving in, but I don't know if I like the thought of Mark Zuckerberg having ownership of all these different things in one place either, which is what I loved about Twitter in the first place was it wasn't attached. I don't tend to use Facebook all that often anymore. Um, Instagram is really the place that I spend my time and I'm not on TikTok because I did watch Four Corners, I'm never getting that app. Um, but I do dip in to see what young people, because I do like the function that I can watch it without having to be logged into the platform and being um, a part of it. Um, so I think, I don't know, it's kind of interesting. I don't know how threads will go knowing that this, you know, Facebook is still quite dominant for Indigenous um, people, uh, Instagram is sort of where the young cohort hang out, but then the really, you know, that really younger cohort, I guess, of under 25s is really, you know, uh, TikTok is where it's at and where they sit. Um, and I, I watch my, I've got an 18 and a 19 year old um, niece, and I watch their habits um, and how they use, and they're on Instagram, but they're also on Snapchat which I find thoroughly interesting. And I, I know I'm not supposed to know that they're on Snapchat and I'm yet to ask them about their conversations. But even the conversation I had with my 14 year old nephew the other day, he's on Discord all the time. My mother doesn't understand Discord. So he's at her place, at grandma's place, on Discord, learning about the Ukraine-Russia conflict at the moment and having these very robust conversations with me where I'm like, where did you get this information? And he's like, uh, I'm on Discord. And I'm like, does your grandma know? And then I'm trying to explain to my mum what Discord is. But it's interesting to see, yeah, where young people are going, but also whether we will have um, a, as big of a community as we've had on Twitter transferring across to whatever comes next. I know a lot of people gravitated to Mastodon. That was a password too far for me. Um, I might jump into Blue Sky, I don't know. Um, but I think um, even though Twitter has always had trolls for the Indigenous community, um, I think there was the ability in knowing that there were a lot of you on there. So if people came for you, uh, that you would have support of others backing you up and others sort of being in your corner. But I think it's got even worse lately. I think it's become a really um, dangerous place actually for Indigenous people to be or any person of colour, to be honest. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much for that perspective. I hope that it's answered it. It probably did. It's, it's as good an answer as I think we can get at the okay, moment. Okay, great. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Um, Rihanna, thank you for your keynote. It was amazing. Um, it was a lot, of, a lot of thoughts came to me as you were talking um, and I want to just draw a couple of threads together and try to turn it into a question. Um, shout out to the Koori Mail. I'm from Lismore. I get the Koori Mail. Um, the other interesting thing in Lismore with the withdrawal of the local paper, the Northern Star, there's now the Lismore app. Citizen journalists, it's, it, it, it runs on no money. Lismore's got no money. Um, and I've watched this and I'm on the Lismore app as well. and. It is the thirst for community. So people want community and there is this sort of grassroots thing going on in lots of places. And I wanted to connect that too with our concern about how toxic some of the social media platforms have become, how, how we also have a thirst for safety. 
and then you put that together with children and wanting to hear children's voices at the same time as wanting to ensure that there is a community-led safe place for them. Um, so I'm wondering what you think, think about um, or have you seen some examples of, of where younger people are engaged and there is that kind of learning and I'm going to connect community radio because when I was 13, I started to work at 2NCRFM. Oh, I'm so jealous. Community radio. And I did that through my, to my 20s. Whole school, high school years. And it's, it is an amazing um, community to work in as well. So in Indigenous radio, do you feel like some of that engagement with younger people is, is happening too? Or how, are we, how, how can we get children connected in this way and help them to learn by doing and engaging and being? Yeah, I was really lucky when I was at, I started at AAA Murray Country, the Indigenous community radio station here in the country, it's country music, knew nothing about country music at the time. But I think that's really interesting because a lot of the broadcasters I was on air with had started as like eight year olds um, in what later became Koori Radio in Sydney um, when it was Radio Redfern um, back in the day. And so um, it was quite strange being with people who'd been on air for at least 10 years and they were only turning 16 or whatever. Like it was, um, you know, but I think that's changing. And I was only having this conversation actually at the in community NAIDOC ball on the weekend where I ran into Naomi Moran from the Wakuri Mail, um, Belinda Miller, who I used to work with at AAA, who's now over at NITV. And we're having a very big conversation about how hard it is to find people at the moment. So um, you've got... Uh, Indigenous journalists, few, uh, you know, few that are out there, um, they're either being taken from NITV by the ABC, um, having, you know, possibly a bad experience, they're leaving the sector and when they're leaving they may go back to NITV, um, they can't be, we can't afford them in Indigenous media to bring them back because, you know, it's about a $40,000 drop in their pay. Um, and then they leave the sector. So I'm seeing a lot of really talented, university trained Indigenous journalists leaving the sector altogether, going into either university comms or just not, just retraining. Um, and I think that's really quite scary because for me, when I was going through um, journalism at university, we there weren't a lot of us. So we all kind of knew each other, we knew who did what. Now I don't even know half the Indigenous journalists out there who've come through university, but I think losing that skill base that isn't coming back to Indigenous media is affecting it more. The other problem that I've heard anecdotally from a number of different stations is they can't get young people who want to be on air. I don't know about you, but if someone said, do you want your own hour to play whatever you want that doesn't have swearing and fits the ACMA guidelines right, um, to come, I don't know how they're not going, yes, sign me up, I will come in, teach me everything that you know. It, that I think with social media, they don't need radio anymore, unfortunately. You know, they um, already have a way of showing themselves to the world, of getting their voice out. And I don't think radio is necessarily any more front of mind, particularly in communities that have good internet, um, where they can do whatever they want on their phones and they can interact. And I mean, I'll be honest, like when I'm watching um, stories from back home, a lot of the young people, particularly on TikTok, who are Islanders, and yes, there's an Islanders Facebook TikTok page for the old people who don't get TikTok, um, who can watch these videos. It's always them out on a dinghy, going hunting, going fishing, basically just rubbing it in that you're not there um, and there's none of this that you will be able to eat with them. But they use it so well in showing cultural ways of being and knowing and life and um, and I just don't think radio offers that because it's there's no pictures really um, and they don't see it as having pictures even though it sort of can these days. Um, but yeah, I don't know and, and I know that yeah, um, finding young people to come into, as I said, a lot of Indigenous radio, community radio stations are still running on volunteers. To not have that next generation coming through makes me incredibly concerned about what that looks like 20, 30 years from now in who's running the stations um, and who's on air. Okay, we have time for another question or two. So um, someone else like to ask a question or I'll, I'll just jump in and ask more. Uh, yeah, thanks. 
the person behind you. No kidding. To Erica. Um, yeah, my, my question was sort of related to the uh, community radio and the volunteers. So I think you've already started to touch on that there with the idea of um, the, these community radio stations are supported like primarily through volunteers, but you're sort of not, you're, you know, you don't have that next generation stepping up. Um, and you mentioned as well that you have, um, they sort of primarily relied on funding. My question was, is that really stable funding? Like are these community radio stations knowing they're getting a certain amount of money per year or are they like having to hunt and put in grants and sort of chase for those, um, for that funding? Uh, yes, that was sort of my question. And also um, if that sort of is really unstable funding, are you, do you think you're gonna see more of those internet radios or podcasts or moving more to like digital platform? I mean like, um, online platforms instead yeah yeah good question um i think the funding one is an interesting one it is always federal government funding um, a lot of it there are some stations that get small amounts of sponsorship that come through or they have local businesses which sponsor particular programs um, the problem is is that sometimes the funding might only be for 12 months um, so there's sometimes a lot of overlapping of funding to have staff around to do what you need to get done but then you might not be able to keep them on afterwards um, a lot of indigenous radio to um, well kenya is one um, where cdp is used so people on work for the doll will actually like part of their work can be working in the radio station so there is a lot of those models um, that exist as well i um, mean how they get volunteers um but yeah it's it's this question that i've had for a long time because you're so dependent on government funding to keep your station going what would that look like if we flipped that dynamic of being able to be self-sustainable taking a bit of that power back where we're not so heavily reliant on government but also the independence that that gives you in a way too um and the ability to i guess be able to broadcast pretty much what you want within the guidelines that exist in Australian law. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know what the answer is going forward of how. Um, I just know that those that have, um, like the Koori Mail, invest a lot into the sector as well. Um, as I said, it's not just money that is going to their community, which is benefiting. Um, it's also about sharing those resources to other Indigenous radio stations um, and other media organisations when they need it too, um, which they've done um, for a few people in the past um, and still currently do. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not. Sh I yeah, I have no answers about the the funding. But for me, you know, being independent of government you know, I guess is front and foremost of what I would like to see because it makes a lot of sense. But, you know, I also, when I worked at um, AAA, um, the late Tiger Bales was very clear about what we took money for and what we didn't take money. And one of, like we had, he'd never take uh, money that was advertising alcohol, gambling or mining companies and um, all multinationals. Um, so, you know, there could be a lot of, uh, stations that could, I guess, get funding in different ways, but because of the way, the ethics that they have about how they want to run themselves and what money they're willing to take and why, um, that is quite, um, it's quite um, common actually among a lot of stations, depending on where they are. Okay, I think we have time for just one final question from Kate. Um, as you're talking, I'm listening and thinking to myself, I'm just going back to that one mob idea out of coughs, you know, kind of that's the thing that keeps kind of ticking at the back of my brain here. And I was thinking back to Al Gore's citizen journalism, which I think was way before its time and, and maybe a bit political, but where they, um, when when contributors, when, and, and then bringing it back to the child, when a contributor contributed an, a certain amount of stories, their next story was paid for. And so, uh, and that that was, uh, there was there's this model. I think there's a another model that we've kind of forgotten existed. Um, and if you are a young person now, you never even knew it existed because it's been gone for so long, and we don't talk about it. Yeah. And so I'm just yeah. I just think it's a really interesting thing for us to be thinking about, especially when we're talking about how do we how do we bring this through a nation. 
um, but also how do we honour the fact that this has started in coughs and that it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good local solution. But as you say, how can that then be rolled out to other communities, but also having some love around it when it comes to the sustainability of it financially um, as well. And some of it, um, it, yeah, you know what I mean? Like anyway, I just want to say thanks for bringing it up because it was, it was really glorious to hear that today. So thanks heaps. Yeah, and look, um, First Nations Media Australia, which is kind of, um, I guess, the organisation that NEMA sort of went on to become after NEMA's work was kind of done, um, and it represents the Indigenous media landscape. They've had a news gathering project for a while now um, where uh, those filing stories that I could get in the nurse newsroom and use, um, they will they get paid per story for that. But what they found is that the sustainability of that on top of the job of running the station, being on air and trying to fit in doing stories to then add to that project is where it's kind of, there's yeah, been a disconnect. And it's sort of like there's a whole lot of people who want to support storytelling, who want to support news gathering, who are outside of the normal, as you say, alcohol booze and, and, and mining that are putting their hand up to want to help grow these things. So it'd be, I think it's, we're in fascinating times and I think it's something that the digital child could really look at. And last but not least, thank you so much for letting me know that Taurus News is back in Torres Strait on our hands. Nice to hear. <laughs> yeah, subscribe. <laughs> I will, I will. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think we need to wrap it up there because we're moving on to our next section. But I just wanted to say that um, this has been an absolutely wonderful keynote to get the conversation started about um, the whole concept of connected learning. And uh, one, of the, one of the points about connected learning is that learning happens, of course, not just in school, but in community spaces, but also through the media um, and on social media and, and so on, right? And um, so Rihanna's um, keynote has really reminded us that um, connected learning happens in powerful ways in, in crucially important ways and we always need to be think, reflecting on you know the, the kinds of stories that we're telling ourselves um, in this nation and who gets to tell those stories and um, you know the fact that we need to be encouraging our students to be to be asking those questions too so thank you so much Rihanna